Oh, oh. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Are we? And go. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, welcome to the Metatron, the Meta Planner. I go. So, yeah. Um, so, sorry. Um, so, uh, my uh, name is uh, Edna, and uh, uh, my pronouns are uh, they, them, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, well, Godomans is my first fandom uh, at the young age of 42. Um, I met Good Omens uh, thanks to the TV series. Uh, I watched the series in one evening and then one night, uh, then I read the book uh, uh, the day after, and then I reread it the day after, and the uh, day after I started writing fan fiction in earnest for the first time in my life. And I have to say that uh, the book's theme of uh, embracing imagination and uh, imperfection too uh, is, is one of the reasons why I had the courage to do it, to start writing. So today I'm going to ramble about why I love makers. And after me, Anathema uh, is going to talk about uh, one of uh, their favorite meta uh, with some delicious examples. Um, so, without further ado, the meta turn. Uh, so, I uh, believe that sorry, metas uh, make our lives uh, better, both as fans and as curious people in general. Uh, they allow us to have uh, an immersive experience uh, in a fictional universe, making it feel more real. But they also help us extrapolate uh, from this fictional universe uh, uh, ideas uh, that can change the way we see our everyday real world. So, uh, first of all, notice that I said uh, metas. Uh, uh, there are a lot of kinds of meters. I think there is a spectrum of meters and of fun theories. So, so one might ask, uh, are all of these meters valid? Um, no, I'm not going to go into the uh, whole, whole death of the author bait. Um, I just say, I'm going just to say that I think that uh, for sure, all metas can bring something into our lives, uh, to our experience of the universe, be it a fictional, the fictional or the real world. So but let's look, let's see what a meta looks like. They are just something to offer. On one extreme, there is the literal canon. So let's say that uh, we're asking if uh, Aziraphale and Crowley are angels. Yes, they are. Or we might ask uh, if uh, is Wesley Dale's first name, Jerry. Yes, it is. What does this imply? That's a further step. We can move a bit farther along the spectrum. And uh, that's, what, that's what we can read in the canon, sorry, using uh, uh, what is more or less a standard language of the medium or some shared cultural codes. So for instance, we can analyze the Benson scene 
using the conventions of uh, visual storytelling. And uh, you can see that, for instance, in all the long shots, uh, Aziraphale is blocked by a rail. Uh, so Mr. Douglas McKinnon is telling us that uh, Aziraphale is caged, that he can't break free. Or we could go in the church in uh, 1941. We have someone dressed in white walking down an aisle. We have someone arriving later with a grand entrance uh, or at least a memorable one. We have a discussion about uh, taking a new name. All of these are typical of wedding. Then you can start looking for patterns and uh, you can use them to have a better insight into the story, into the characters, into the message. Um, about finding patterns, uh, just yesterday I was finally listening to uh, David Tennant interviewing Neil Gaiman on his podcast. Uh, and uh, uh, Neil Gaiman said something to which I think any fan and not just good Omens fans can testify. Uh, he said, and I quote, uh, humans are believing machines. We're also pattern finding machines. We can find patterns and stories in anything. And one of the things that you learn as a writer is that all you need is a good idea and the world will demonstrate that it's true for you. So let's look for patterns in our story. Uh, here is where we start to go from interpreting the fictional universe using the real one to uh, use uh, the uh, fictional universe to deduce something about our everyday life, to our, about our values, about our identities. Uh, uh, by the way, this kind of meta, if you're a writer and you want to write an alternate universe uh, fanfic, I think it's very useful because uh, in this kind of meta, you learn to pin down uh, uh, the core of the characters of the situations. Uh, anyway, there are different patterns you can look for. For instance, you can look for patterns in the, the way the story is told in the storytelling. Uh, for instance, Wales, Green City, Wales. Uh, there are whales all over, <laughs> good omens. Uh, at first, when uh, Crowley tries to convince uh, Aziraphale to choose uh, the world over his duty as an angel, uh, Crowley says uh, the point is dolphins and whales. Uh, this is a foreshadowing. Later, Anathema and Adam uh, share uh, bond over different beliefs and causes and one is saving the whales. We have a glimpse of how Adam can convince his friends uh, when Pepper goes from, uh, why do we have to save the whales to, oh my God, I want to be a whale, two minutes. Uh, then uh, we have uh, Adam choosing to destroy the world justifying this, uh, among other things, by a need to create a perfect world where whales are safe. And uh, finally, when he realizes that uh, human beings have to make it on their own and bear the consequences of their uh, choices, uh, he uses the example, the only sensible thing to, is for people to know that if they kill a whale, We've got a dead whale. So if we follow the whales uh, uh, in good omens, uh, we have all the core themes, themes uh, of the book. Uh, we have uh, the love of the imperfect but interesting world over the better and uh, inhuman one. We have the power of uh, telling stories. We have the power of human connections. 
we have the power of imagination and of free will. Uh, you are going to see another example of this after me. Uh, Anathema is going to analyze the role of food in good omens and follow the food. And shout out Silverock and her symbolism in the good omens props and costume panel was earlier today. Mm, if you weren't there, check out uh, the video because it was amazing. Anyway, let's move on. We can look for patterns that connect the story in the canon and some domain knowledge. Uh, by the way, the things I've learned in this fandom, yes, you probably can imagine if you're a fan, but I'm still find it astonishing. So let's go back to the cold open as many of us tend to do. And let's go back to the scene in the Bentley when Aziraphale opens up to the possibility of uh, a relationship with Crowley that is no longer completely clandestine. And he gives him uh, the holy water. And the scene is set in 1967, which is the same year in which uh, sexual relationships between gay men were legalized in England. So we have uh, an implication that uh, as you Raphael and Crowley are a couple, a clandestine, romantic, queer couple. We have a commentary about, again, the intrinsic power of relationships, I think, uh, with the thermos, and uh, about the disruptive power of uh, forbidden relationships. And then again, in this uh, scene, uh, we have uh, uh, Azrafel Thermos, which is in the same pattern pattern as his bow tie. Now, uh, I'm not an expert on this, but I uh, found out, thanks to good omens, that uh, you can give your tartan only to people of your clan. So this is a sign that Azrafel recognizes that he and Crowley are on their own side. Now, this meta has already quite a strong uh, transformative uh, world building component. It carries the seed of fanon and fanfiction, uh, and we'll come to that uh, in a while. Now, because from here we can abstract further by going down two paths, we can use all the metas above as an example, for instance, to support or better understand us cultural, social, political commentary. Or we can move into the uh, territory of head canons, storytelling, fanon, and transformative works. Uh, these two paths are connected uh, because uh, every social commentary is a narrative and every story can exist in a cultural context uh, and a political context. But uh, I'm going to start with comment an example of commentaries. Um, so, for instance, a social commentary born out of a meter could be uh, look at the representation of gender in good omens and uh, tied with uh, defining or not defining our uh, own gender identities uh, and orientations. Uh, uh, Caspian earlier today gave a talk about it and uh, it was, check it out, it was fantastic. Uh, an example of political commentary that I love is uh, to, to compare uh, the translation from the book to the TV series. Uh, and we could use it to argue that uh, the ruthlessness of late stage capitalism is the new fear of uh, a no nuclear annihilation in the Cold War. Uh, we could uh, say that uh, Aziraphale's softness is an act of resistance to corporate efficiency. We could uh, talk about how there is a fundamental equivalence between old style and oppressive white collar jobs in hell 
and uh, disruptive and friendly startups in heaven. Sorry. This is... Now, uh, we can go down the route of uh, head cannons and fanons, uh, where the creativity of the fandom takes the cannon and the meters and runs with it. And it becomes the voice of God. Uh, now, two rules. Uh, know that it's not canon, respect other people's head cannons. Um, you can have uh, head cannons that stem from something in the canon that was left open to interpretation. Uh, in the notes, uh, you can find a link to a uh, uh, video by Obliquity about uh, uh, the Meta, about uh, uh, Crowley's identity before his fall. Another classic example. What happened in the night between Saturday and Sunday in Crowley's flat? This uh, is open to a multitude of interpretation. There is a law of fandom. Everyone who writes more than three good omens fakes will end up writing a uh, night in Crowley's flat uh, fic. All these fics will tell a slightly different story. All these fics are precious. And uh, finally, you can have uh, uh, fanons that are born of just a feeling of a character, a situation, and are often filtered through uh, the fandom's transformative works. Now, possibly my favorite example is uh, Aziraphale is uh, the patron saint of uh, uh, the LGBTQ people in Soho, and he speaks Polari, which is the old slang of British gay men. There isn't anything about this in the book or in the TV series or in the radio show. We just know that Aziraphale lives in Soho. Aziraphale acts like a gay man. Thanks to amazing fanfics and uh, fan art uh, and metas, uh, more often than not, I confess that uh, the Aziraphale in my head does speak Polari. Uh, does it matter whether it's canon or not? I don't think so. I think it's more interesting that uh, I am reading a book about Polari, thanks to this meta. So to conclude, uh, there are many metas, many ways to extrapolate something from the beautiful book uh, and the TV series and the radio drama that we've got. They're all different. They're all precious, and it's nice to create them together. And if that reminds you of all stories, uh, uh, you're not the only one. And uh, now I'll go on to Anathema, who's going to talk about uh, the delightful meta of food in good omens. Hi, everyone. So, um, hi, Anathema here. So I'm a, f I'm a fan from the Philippines, and I enjoy the Good Omens fandom in as many ways as I possibly can, as a writer, an artist, a cosplayer, musician, whatever else I can get into. And one of the things that I enjoy thoroughly is meta. So similar to what Edna said, it provides a bridge between the world of the creator and the world of the author, uh, and the world of the fans, sorry, in that it allows fans to see the world that they love through the, through the lenses that are uniquely theirs. And I would like to share with you an example of a meta that I was exploring for a while through my own lens, because I am a food scientist by profession. So that means I'm not really the best person to go with uh, on grocery shopping trips, but you know, that's neither here nor there. Um, so the thing is, food shows up a lot in Good Omens. And normally that would not be surprising because this story does take place in our world. There's food in our world <laughs> and thank God that there is. Um, it's not like we can go through a day without uh, consuming a little bit of it. But what I find interesting is how food is utilized in the storytelling of Good Omens, the role that it plays and how characters interact with it. In fact, even at the very beginning, 
God and the universe interact through food, even though the bit about the salads was inaccurate. So let's go look at the Bible because that's where a lot of this begins. So uh, in the Old Testament, we see we read about food being part of the downfall of humanity, the act of consuming the fruit of uh, knowledge of good and evil leads to humanity's downfall. But at the same time, we also read stories of food being part of humanity's salvation in terms of manna from heaven to feed the Israelites when they fled Egypt. So this strange dichotomy for food, at least in the Old Testament, shows that food is not really something born of earth, even though it sounds like it's something that we grow and we cultivate. This is still linked very closely to heaven and to hell. And in between stories like that of the temptation and the escape from Egypt, you have many stories all involving food about feasting and fasting and whole psalms are sung in praise to God for the gift of food. And it looks like it's an interesting thing because that very first bite that led to humanity's downfall led to many more bites that are now considered to be blessings. At the same time, though, the Old Testament also contains the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, which details whole long lists of what food is considered clean and unclean. They actually devoted time to list these down. But there's no detail as to why. Why are these foods considered clean or unclean in the first place? It's just instruction under threat of damnation. Something so necessary to the survival of mankind is still on some level being regulated by the Almighty. It's a very subtle game that she plays. And in the New Testament though, food is slightly elevated in that it's beyond just human survival, but even going all the way to eternal life. So Jesus Christ is referred to as the bread from heaven and he refers to himself being transformed into literal bread and wine to bring salvation to mankind. There are so many stories of him eating with different people, feeding the hungry crowds, and then all the way to the Last Supper, where he establishes the rights of the Catholic faith. So how does this link to Good Omens? Very neatly, because uh, Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett, genius authors that they are, they follow very similar, uh, similar styles in elevating the role of food. So in both the book and the series, food is often a bridge uh, between humans and the powers that be whether they be, they be ethereal or occult or somewhere in between. So a particularly interesting example is that of famine. How is famine portrayed in Good Omens? So contrary to the popular and traditional portrayal of famine as uh, you know, scenes of agricultural collapse and you know, emaciated bodies fighting over food stubs, famine in Good Omens is a suave, smooth businessman who finds his job pretty easy because he is able to promote voluntary starvation among the rich and the privileged. He is in his element in fancy restaurants where people are paying top dollar to eat two little bites on a very large plate. And famine's business displays further this distortion in modern eating habits and the extent of manipulation in food accessibility and security. His job is partly to sell food-free food, providing that illusionary experience of food, but providing no nourishment. So personally, I, as a food scientist, I don't fully agree with this because the whole spun, plated, and woven protein molecules and lab modification of foods, uh, they do have their place and they can have benefits, but I digress. The message that is being sent here in Good Omens is quite clear, it's quite strong. The end of the world is not always in large explosions of war, even though in the book they start putting it towards nuclear war. It can also be there in the very food that you eat, not with a bang, but with a whimper. But in the same vein, changing the world can also be done that way, as another scene from Good Omens will show. So when Adam begins to come into his powers, one of his first major acts, unconscious as it may be, is to deactivate a nuclear power plant by simply willing away the nuclear material. But what does he leave behind in its place? He leaves behind a sherbet lemon. It's a simple, innocuous sweet, one of his little pleasures while reading Anathema's New Aquarians. It's tiny, it's forgettable. And it is showing that if the world can end with a whimper, 
to the foodless future of famine. It can also be saved with a whisper in a child's mind and this exchange of highly dangerous substance with something as simple as candy. Another interesting way that food is used in Good Omen is, is that it's often the creator of conversation. Yes, it can be part of large and dramatic plots like Famine's business and Adam's powers, but it's also present in small moments that provide deeper insight into the characters and situations. The them is great for this. There are a large amount of their discussions revolve around food or are triggered by food, arguing about the number of flavors in ice cream, determining if French, uh, if Spanish onions are good to use for the Spanish Inquisition. And, I, and deciding if mint and sage are allowed by God to be used by humans, so they're not going to be part of witch's brew. So the foods that trigger these kinds of discussions, they're not feasts either. They are simple, they are accessible, they are to a word down to earth. But through them, even though the, the, the discussions seem very simple, we see the different characters and personalities of them. We see what they value, what they are curious about what they are eager to explore. And this kind of insight leads to a big part of them not wanting Armageddon to proceed. Because after all, like you would expect that like, why would children even be invested in the end of the world? Through these interactions over something as simple as food and what they think about food, you can see that they very much want to save it. <laughs> and it's also through food that the initial conversations between Shadwell and Newt become genuine discussions and even nuggets of advice. So I personally thought it was a sweet and kind of sad contrast that when Newt starts his, his job, his mother packs him sandwiches. When he loses his job, he goes to a hot dog truck and there he meets Shadwell. I might be overreaching here, but I feel like this is like somewhat, in my, in my meta, it's like uh, Newt interacting with different parental figures through comfortable and familiar food. And definitely, that conversation there started over tea with nine sugars, eventually led to him becoming a witch finder himself. And speaking of tea and sugar or tea and condensed milk, that particular beverage also sparked conversations as, you know, as loud as they may be between Shadwell and Madame Tracy, eventually culminating in a deeper connection, one that they come to over a shared meal. And beyond conversation is connection. It has always been known that there is a different and powerful connection that is had by sharing meals. And this is perhaps best demonstrated by Aziraphale and Crowley. Angel and demon they are, but they share the earth and as such they share a table. So uh, really, to start with, we see Aziraphale and Crowley sharing meals together in a lot of occasions through the book and the series. But it's not highlighted as a big deal. There's no fanfare, there's no, ooh, this is so weird. It's they have lunch, they share drinks, they share a lot of drinks. Uh, they get a meal before continuing on the road. And they do have some witty food choices. Like I love in the book how Aziraphale orders deviled eggs and Crowley orders angel cake. Though in the end, I think it is Aziraphale who eats the cake. Uh, the meals themselves are generally unremarkable. It's just part of their routine, something they do. And it's distinctly human as we will see in a very huge contrast, the way Aziraphale interacts with Gabriel over food. So Aziraphale clearly likes food. He savors not just the taste, but also the, right, the ritual of its consumption. You know, dipping it in soy sauce, it's nice. Gabriel, however, refers to it as gross matter. It's not only unnecessary, but it's something that could dirty him, could bring him down to the level of humans. And this is really telling because it just shows the difference of the connection that they have with the human world. Aziraphale relishes this interaction with humans. Gabriel considers it beneath him. And this is further reinforced in subsequent episodes when he tells Aziraphale to lose the gut. This, the, uh, you know, it's like he's saying that the consumption of food in an angelic corporation is a sign of weakness. And this is really an interesting point because, for me anyway, that Aziraphale, an angel, through the act of eating food, he doesn't just do this to blend in with the humans. He's thoroughly attached to them, and happily so. It is eating that transforms what is initially foreign and alien to angels into something personal and relatable. It's one thing to look at food as an angel, 
it's a whole other thing to eat it. It creates a connection. It's deeper. And it's an even greater connection when it's shared with another one who is willing to partake. So that connection through food is highlighted further as being the actual goal of these meals together. So consider the idea that I'm sure that you've seen this going around, that Aziraphale consumes food not just because he enjoys it, but because it's an excuse to spend time with Crowley. Their very first conversation that does not involve work is in Rome, and it's because of food. It's Aziraphale saying he's in Rome to try out oysters, and Crowley responds by saying he's never had one. It's this conversation that, about food and the invitation that it creates that that initial tension between the two starts to dissipate. So Crowley is no longer as snippy, and Aziraphale continues the conversation far more relaxed than how he started. And the two have a long way in le learning how to talk to one another, but food has given them a way to spend time together and as well as a safe space where they can leave behind the requirements of their job assignments. And this continues throughout history. Uh, I adore the cold open and I genuinely took note of all the food and drink present and nearly all scenes have it. Um, even if it's not physically present, it's referred to in some measure. Like for example, Aziraphale mistakes Crowley's fomenting as porridge when they meet in Wessex and he enjoys grapes while watching Hamlet at the Globe. And of course, the crepes and brioche, yes. We learn in this particular uh, part of the cold open that food is not just a passing enjoyment for Aziraphale. It's something he seeks the highest standards of. And even though Crowley has, is kind of judging how far Aziraphale is going to go for those crepes, he still agrees to lunch with Aziraphale to try them. And this shows an interesting dynamic that shows up again in the current timeline of the show. Um, when Crowley invites Aziraphale to lunch, he does it in the mindset that he owes Aziraphale something. He's framing it as a work lunch. It's Aziraphale who frames it as something social. Neither of them can remember who was responsible for the reign of terror, but Crowley remembers owing him lunch, and Aziraphale remembers eating crepes. And not just the food, but the experience of them partaking it. It's not I had crepes, it's we had crepes. It was the shared experience that remained in memory. And we really can't discuss the role of food in this particular relationship without bringing up that moment after giving the holy water that references the possibility of, you know, of all the things the reference as a possibility, it is food, the possibility of a picnic and dining at the Ritz. And while food doesn't make an appearance physically in this scene, it's there in terms of it's the thing that references the connection between the two. It's Aziraphale bringing up the possibility of a future of shared experiences, shared meals, a future that Crowley will not even need holy water. And Aziraphale won't have to turn him down when he offers to go anywhere that he wants to go. So this is something that is supposed to be theirs. And that is what they are striving for towards the end. And I think this one, like one last thing, uh, because I know like talking about food for 10 minutes isn't great. Um, in the beginning of the show, it is Crowley who utilizes food as examples of things Aziraphale will stand to lose if heaven wins the war. So yes, Aziraphale enjoys Gravlax de dill sauce and Chateauneuf de Pape. But more importantly, it is food that allows him time with Crowley. And this is unspoken, but the scene highlights it in its own way all the same. Because it's not Aziraphale listing down these very specific foods and very specific favorite things. It is Crowley, the one who he has shared these meals with and therefore understands and accepts exactly what he enjoys, the way no angel in heaven ever could. And funny enough, after all through this in the series where food is actually a subtle driver of story, at the end of the show, it takes secondary role because the two of them now have the freedom to enjoy each other's company without the pretense. In that last meal at the Ritz, there's no more hiding, no more cover up of work. Food is no longer the excuse. It's just a way for them to exist as they choose. And it's something that they share in every real and human sense of the word. There are many more moments in both book and series where food can be found playing a driving role. I'm sure of it because I, I made a list. <laughs> but overall though, like what you can kind of see just from this short meta, yes, as Edna said, it's all about finding those patterns and putting meaning to them. I, as a food scientist, thrilled to be able to see this in Good Omens, that food 
is rarely ever just an on the side item of the story. Often, it's a conversation. It's an intersection. It's a point where something new can arise. And with so many occasions like that happening in good omens, I mean, you can really only say cheers. That's my kind of meta. Yep. I'm not actually drunk, guys. <laughs> So, right. So, actually, before we continue, is there are there any questions that you guys want to bring up, or or did I just like make you hungry? Because <laughs> that that wasn't that wasn't the that wasn't part of the plan. I I promise. <laughs> <laughs> questions about like your or if you guys want to share like stories of your own favorite metas you know we would totally welcome that Ooh, it's actually, it's actually uh, we a have a question yeah um from uh, lolo when you lay out connection like this uh, it can look so opposite. Uh, mm. uh, do you have any thoughts about the process of writing these things in? Is it just as good uh, uh, when the inclusion is unconscious? I don't know. Uh... For me, I think it's actually, it, I think part of the joy of meta is making those connections. And it's always more fun when they're not as obvious. So I will admit that I could only come up with all of those conclusions about food by listing down and literally noticing all the food <laughs> that they have in Good Omens. So I guess to answer that question of, uh, is it better if it's subtle or is there a process that we write these things in? Normally it comes with make, first making one connection, at least in, in my experience in writing meta. You make that one connection and you see if there's anything deeper coming out of it. Sometimes, you know, there's, there's always that part where you kind of question whether it's already an overreach, but usually it starts from that one connection and then you kind of see where it takes you. And normally where it takes you is down a pit of like research, <laughs> as, as you'll probably see, like actually when you watch Obliquity's video, I'm like so in awe of the amount of theological study and research into art and mythology that that had to take. But it, but it started from one or two connections and it became something bigger. What do you think, Edna? I agree. Uh, for me, it's just uh, random. I see a connection. Uh, I try to, s I watch the series or read the book over and over and uh, try to see if uh, it's that far-fetched or not. And, uh, but most of all on uh, Tumblr, uh, I devour metas uh, and uh, I love to find out uh, uh, new things uh, thanks to metas. And uh, there are so many, as I said, so many talented people that uh, that's what I, that's what, that's what uh, I enjoy. <laughs> Another. Yeah, I see a question that in the last scene at the Ritz, is there about five plates of desserts on the table? I actually counted this at one point. Um, <laughs> I, th uh, I think if you include the cup of coffee as well as the side condiments that you technically can uh, consume, there are six. But let me double check. I, re I distinctly remember, like I think on the Effia Good Omens Tumblr, someone did actually go to the restaurant where they filmed that scene and it's like it's a high tea um uh meal set and it, it's quite fancy and it's yeah it's about four plates stacked on top of each other of like of containing sweets and then you have two other plates of like your main course so around six <laughs> um there is uh, uh 
what's the strangest set of characters you found a subtle connection between through innocuous matters in your experience? Uh, uh, for me, there is uh, a meta of uh, which is uh, that uh, there is a connection or there's a parallel between uh, Aziraphil, uh, Anathema, and Shadwell on one hand, uh, and uh, Crowley, uh, Newt, uh, and uh, uh, Tracy on the other. So on one hand, uh, you have the uh, um, determinism and the purity on the other you have free will creativity uh temptation uh, and cars too uh, so that's my favorite uh, parallel in um, uh, in characters what about you Anna? Mm, man, let me think do i have the strangest set of characters you found a subtle connection. The thing is, I don't know if I would actually like. I, I don't know if the if the right if the right word is strange because I don't find it strange. I always find it like slightly fascinating. Um, but I think one of the connections, not really between characters, but I guess just like one of the most like interesting sets of meta that I enjoyed was the notion of how. Uh, Crowley is always the one circling Aziraphale during the arrangement. This is kind of like linked by the idea that he knows how much more there is to lose. So he's the one who, you know, who's kind of unconsciously or like subtly trying to protect Aziraphale the best way he can. And he does this all the way to the end because in the park scene when they are captured, it is Aziraphale who is captured first and that's Crowley actually. And that's exactly how he planned it to be. That in the event that they were ever found out, he would go first. And I adored that. <laughs> Also, again, guys, just a quick shout out that um, if, you, if you can, if you can, actually, no, not if you can, you should watch Obliquity's video in the description. It is really interesting uh, in terms of uh, Crowley's identity before the fall. It's a pretty popular meta, but the research that goes into it and the analysis is astounding. So just putting that out there. Uh, I think we have time for one last uh, question. Uh, I'd go with uh, uh, Ethelfled, who asked, uh, do you have a favorite? I know this is crazy, but hear me out, Meta. <laughs> you go first while I try to think about this. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I'm like, this is crazy, but hear me out. Okay. This is crazy, but hear me out. Uh... <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> They all seem they all seem reasonable to me. So, no one, nothing is crazy. All my metas are perfectly reasonable. That's, <laughs> yes. yeah, that's fair because it's it's you know like you said it's like love all metas as much as you can, you know, and I would actually have to agree with you. Um, yeah, like when I think about it, like even though when I'm when I'm reading meta, it's never like crossed my mind as this is crazy. This isn't this is probably too much of a reach already. I always try to think that actually, no, what if I what if I consider it? And I guess that's probably something that I want to bring up is a really good thing in meta is that it actually allows you to be even to be open minded, you know, to explore new possibilities and find those linkages for yourself. So at this point, I have yet to find like a meta that really made me think like, no, 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 this is too much. But <laughs> so sorry if that's not a, if that's not a great answer to the question that I don't have a, this is crazy, but hear me out meta. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, yes, I, I think uh, we are really running out of time. Yeah, uh, so, okay. Uh, oh, but I think that we just have like one last question, which I would love to answer to kind of you know, encourage people. Where do you find meta discussions most often? Uh, this one is a good one. Like you often find this actually more on Tumblr, but I occasionally also find it on Reddit. But I think it was mentioned in previous panels that there is a Good Omens meta library on Tumblr. Really great resource. You can uh, start there and it's always a great source of discussion. Yes, for me, it's uh, partly Tumblr, 
partly uh, the Discord server uh, in which I am uh, uh, because I write fanfics uh, and I started uh, joining Discord servers. And uh, there are a lot of meta discussions there. Join, join us. Join us. <laughs> Start a right. It's this is more fun than a thesis defense, believe me, because I've had to sit <laughs> through those. All right, so I think that uh, and that's it. So again, reminder, reminder. Please, please, please watch Obliquity's vid. I swear this is really, really good, really good stuff. Um, and I think with that, uh, thank you so much. If you guys want to, you know, talk about meta, finally give me something to, that to make me think this is too crazy. Yeah. Uh, we definitely welcome that kind of discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you.